Hello and welcome to the Catch a Lift Coaches Corner. I'm Cal Coach Melissa, and this week I'm honored to welcome U.S. Marine Corps veteran William Irving to the show. Will is the assistant head coach for the Catch a Lift Fund and a police officer in Raleigh, North Carolina. Welcome to this week's episode of the Coaches Corner. Will, welcome. Thanks for being here with us today. Hey, how you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. Thank you. We're so excited to talk with you. Let's jump right into it, Will. Do you want to start off today, Will, by talking to us a little bit about your life growing up and what would ultimately lead you to joining the Marine Corps? Yeah, so I was just a average kid in New Jersey growing up. Uh, I liked to play ice hockey and went to in school and stuff like that, I just kind of knew that I didn't want to go to college and uh, do all that. There was like no other options besides working or, you know, joining the military. So uh, I decided that around junior year of high school that I wanted to join the military. And uh, it just kind of all fell into place. You know, it wasn't like a passion of mine, you know, growing up. But I, I wanted to do something, you know, serve the community somehow. And you couldn't be a police officer unless you were 21. And okay. I didn't, want, I didn't want to wait that long yeah. to do something, you know, get out of my hometown. So I decided I wanted to join the military. And uh, the Marine Corps sent me something in the mail. And uh, I, like, sent something back. It got all rained on and ruined. <laughs> so I went on the website and just did the same, like, request information. And, you know, 20 minutes later, the guy was at my house knocking on my door. My dad had no idea. It was, a, it was chaos. Chaos I and bet. confusion. <laughs> what, did, what did your parents think of it? Oh, they didn't want me to do it. You know, yeah. typical parent thing. My mom and dad kind of fought it a little bit. Um, my mom actually told the recruiters not to let me do it. Uh, she tried to talk them out of letting me do it. And I was like, oh, God bless I, our mothers. I, oh, my gosh. Yeah. I don't think that's how it works, you know. <laughs> And I like snuck out of the house to go to Mets and do all that stuff and like get it all done because they wouldn't let me go. <laughs> and then uh, eventually, once I had already signed, I was like, hey, by the way, uh, I enlisted. Oh, <laughs> FYI, I go in the summertime. And then, uh, you know. Yeah. The rest was history from there for the you. Rest was history. Will, what do you remember most about training up as a young Marine? Well, I just remember I joined in 2010, uh, so a lot of my seniors were initial push, big, you know, hero right. types that I looked up to, and, you know, they stressed the importance of learning everything you can, because when you need it most, you don't really have a choice, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So the more the more you can learn now and then in, up front, the easier it'll be for you when the time comes to use that information. So when I was very young, joining uh, going up in the Marine Corps, I just knew that I just had to be educated, educate myself the best I can, you know, sign myself up to go to schools and all the things that I could do just so that way I had all the information. And, uh, you know, then once I got all that information for free, I knew that I just had to kind of share that with people because, you know, some people don't have the chance to go to schools. Absolutely. And we're going to hit some more on that in a minute. So we... Oh, good morning. Got some uh, some friends woke up. Uh, I was gonna say that's some stuff I you know really admire about you, Will. You know, anytime I've I've known you for quite a few years now, and anytime I'm talking to you, you're always doing something to further your education in one way or another. Going back to college, doing another certification. Uh, so we're gonna definitely get into that. Before we get there, Will, I want you. Uh, will you tell us a little bit about you got married very young and started a family young in the Marine Corps? Talk to us a little bit about that experience and how that played out for you. Uh, that's my favorite story to tell and every year for our anniversary is the best joke. Um, when I was 20 and she was 18, I was stationed in Quantico. I, you know, we met and, uh, she lived about two hours away. So, you know, I would go up there and see her on the weekends and stuff like that. And, um, man, all of our dogs are just not happy. Uh, so once I moved down to Lejeune, you know, I was getting ready to go on the Mew and everything like that. So we were like, what do we do? You know, we wanted to be together. We knew we loved each other and stuff like that. And uh, so then I started going through all like the marriage counseling, you know, that the Marine Corps makes you do. And uh, they, my commander told me no. 
that wasn't allowed to get married and that she was going to turn into a stripper and all this other stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm still going to do it. I'm still going to do it. They told you, you know? she was going to, they told you she was going to be a stripper. Yeah. Yeah. They told me that she was going to turn into a stripper and that she was going to leave me and all this other stuff. And, uh, I'm here to tell you nine years later, she hasn't been a stripper. So I'm still missing out on that money, I guess, but whatever. Um, <laughs> and oh. so, you know, we got, we got married. She was 18, 19. She just turned 19 when we got married. Uh, I was deployed. I left her all alone in North Carolina. You know, for we, we lived together for probably, probably about three weeks before I left. And uh, while we were gone, that's when uh, my dad passed away on that first deployment. So she was with my family when it all happened, and she kind of took care of them, took care of everything. And, uh, you know, once... Once uh, I came home for the funeral, I only got about four days before my command made me go back to the boat, which was yeah. silly. And, uh, you know, she had to help my mom, you know, take care of everything. And all that stuff was kind of hard for her. So I'm just grateful that she was able to be the rock for them while I was gone right. and take care of business for me because it was definitely a hard time for us. Oh, absolutely. That's that's really rough, uh, challenging life stuff to navigate at any age, but especially, you know, newly married with, you know, a young family and, and the passing of family members. Uh, how did you kind of work through that time well to move through it? Well, it, was, it was rough, you know, because when I went back on ship, we were in River City, so there was no communication. Uh, so the morning that I found out he passed away, I was I went to the gym around four in the morning, ate breakfast went back to sleep while everybody else did their little morning routine. And so they came and got me and they had a little print out email, you know, and they brought me to the corner of the boat. Nobody ever goes to the corner of the boat. You know? And he was like, are you close with your family? I was like, yeah. You know, what about your dad? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, well, he's dead. And I was like, what? Oh, man. Like, I couldn't even believe it. Right. So then I went home for those four days and got yelled at over the phone about getting back. And I'm like in my blues, just got done at the funeral and they're yelling at me over the phone. So I'm just like, ah, gotta do the right yeah. thing. <laughs> and I went yep. back, you know, and it was tough because there was no communication. So my wife emailed and asked if I made it okay. Cause the last she heard from me was when I was in Paris, yeah. flying back to Ethiopia to go to Djibouti, Africa, to get on a helicopter to go back to the boat. She hadn't heard from me for a couple countries, and she's tracking all the flights. So she emailed them, and they came up to me with another piece of paper. And I was, like, freaking out. And all, yeah. it said was I, all they said was I needed to call my wife. So obviously I'm having a little panic attack. Yeah. It's the last time oh I had my to gosh. call her. It was right. Bad. So then I called her, and she said, I just wanted to make sure you made it. And I was like, I was so mad. <laughs> I was like, I'm not mad at you. I'm just mad at this yeah, circumstance. Yeah, know? But right. I, was, I was so mad. Every time someone came to me, like, with something, I was like, get away. Yeah. Go away. Uh, you know, so I had to sit there for, like, two more months and just be useless to the family, you know. So that stunk. And, you know, then we have people complaining about little petty problems yeah. on the point. Right. And I'm like... <laughs> Like trying my yeah. hardest to be understanding because you know, everybody goes through things differently. But I'm just like, look, you got to understand it's really not that bad. Like I'm here, you're here, we're all here. Let's get over it. So right. um, it was rough, but we made it through it. And, you know, we came home and kind of just we bought a house the day I got home and, you know, settled in and got things taken care of. And it, was, it was a rough journey, but you know, we, we made it. That's that's terrific. And that's right. I mean, you can look back on it now and look at the, I would assume the strength that it's built between your wife and you, your relationship, the resiliency within your, you know, your entire kind of family unit. Um, Will, talk to us a little bit about some of your fondest memories as a Marine. That's tough. Uh, so uh, for me, I love teaching, I love coaching. I love helping people. It's like what I, for some reason, you wouldn't think it when you meet me, but for some reason, I've just always been helping others. Uh, so the, the best time was probably my last four years. I was a combat instructor um, in Camp Geiger, North Carolina. And those were really 
the best moments for me. It stunk. The privates were annoying. Yeah, we hated ours. But in the long run, it was it was the most fun job. You know, I got to teach people how to shoot and do things and patrols and all that stuff. And the real reason I wanted to do it is because I wanted to go into the live grenade pits and throw grenades with 18-year-old kids who've never held baseball. And uh, every time I finally got my chance to go, every time they let me go down there to the live pits with the kids, it was the best. And I'd always like, you know, message my wife, like, I didn't get blown up yet. LOL, <laughs> you know. <laughs> she was, I'm sure she appreciated yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> I, took, I took some videos and you have kids drop them and, you know, ping, 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 ping. You hear the grenade, and you're like, ah, you know. So it, it was just, it was fun to be in that chaos and be around that type of stuff. So uh, that was probably the best time I had in the military was teaching the next generation, you know, kind of take my place because I knew yeah. that I wanted to get out. I just wanted to have a long enough time to plan, you know, so that way I could take care of my family. Talk to us, Will. So, you know, like you mentioned there, you knew that you were going to be getting out, you know, you were going back home to your family. What were you do doing kind of during those last couple of years to prepare yourself to transition out as an active duty Marine? So it was, it was kind of tough because I, you know, after my dad passed, I pretty much wanted to get out because of how I was treated. Um, but I only had six months, you know, once I got home. So it wasn't long enough. So I reenlisted, you know, to make sure I had a, a, enough solid of a plan. Um, and then during my second enlistment, we had my son. And I was like, man, I really need health care. <laughs> so I'm like, I got I to gotta stay. And then I fell into yeah. that cycle where I just kind right. of stayed because yep. it was, it was the easiest, best thing that I could do. Right. The insurance is there. The benefits are there. Right. Right. Yeah. But I hated it because, you know, for four years of my oldest life, you know, there was months where I didn't even see him awake, you know, and I'd have to come home and tickle his feet just so he'd know I was alive because I wouldn't see him. You know, I'd, I'd leave the house at four in the morning and I wouldn't come home till nine or 10 o'clock at night, you know, and weekends, holidays, birthdays, anniversaries, all that stuff, you know, and just, was not worth it to me. Um, but I didn't have a good enough plan and I needed to take care of my family because my wife stays home with the kids. I'm thankful that she does, you know, right. but I have to make the money and, and get all the benefits and stuff like that so we can be taken care of. And then uh, once I, once I volunteered to go to combat sugar duty, I was like, this is going to be my time to kind of plan. You know, I have three years stateside where the hours stink, but at least I can, scheme and plan and do all that other stuff, you know, so I started doing school, you know, do my exercise science degree and all that stuff and um, building the foundation for what I was going to possibly do, which I didn't end up doing anyway <laughs> because of circumstances and, you know, yeah. whatever, we bounced, we bounced back when I knew I did not want to stay anymore. Um, yeah. And I left and it's been the best thing for my family. We haven't been happier, you know. That's that's tremendous. Very, very happy for you all. Um, so we'll kind of, well, I guess before we I jump too far ahead, talk to us a little bit because something that you did start doing right away, like you said, you're going to school for uh, exercise and everything, but you're also getting certifications in that time. You know, talk to us about ISSA, the process of becoming a, a personal trainer, along with numerous, numerous certifications that you do hold. So it, everybody knows the military's height, weight standards and PT standards and stuff. And they told me I was fat for like my whole career. And <laughs> oh, geez, I, I was yeah. supposed to weigh 165 pounds was my max. And I haven't weighed yeah. 165 pounds since freshman year in high school. Yeah, and, I was going to say like eighth, ninth grade. Yeah. yeah. You know, I sit at like 190, 195. And that's just not how I'm built, you know? Yeah. And so I wanted to get educate myself on fitness so I could see what I could do or if there was even something wrong with me. And so um, the the college I went through, I used to say, you know, they do regular personal training certifications, but they also have their degree plan. Basically, I got the military to cover my tuition, you know, tuition assistance paid for all the classes. And I just did the certifications as the classes. So I got like seven certifications out of them. You know, I was on active duty. I did one every 10 weeks. That's awesome. You know, personal, personal training, nutrition, corrective exercise, exercise therapy, 
behavior modification, all kinds of things. I also did USA weightlifting level two certification while I was in. I just like made that what my life was about and helping, you know, people get in better shape and take care of their bodies because everybody's always in pain. You know, like everybody's always trying to get better. And, you know, I just wanted to be the one to help them out. And, you know, while I was getting educated, I realized that you know, there's nothing really wrong with me and there's nothing I could have really done any better. And my PT scores reflected, you know, it's right. the way yep. that they wanted to measure me with a, with a tape, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so I just dealt with it and I was like, I'm, I know I'm getting out and I'm going to be a free man here soon. So I can get right. the dad bod, beer gut and all that stuff. <laughs> but, uh, um, while I was getting all my education and stuff, I really wanted to get back. And that's kind of how I fell into Cal's lap um, while I was trying to transition because I wanted to find a good organization to kind of help. Talk to us about that, Will. Talk to us about finding Catchalift post-service. So uh, while I was doing my transition, uh, I was doing research on organizations to kind of volunteer for and help out because I was just going to do personal training myself and just train people around me because I had people come to my garage and, you know, I trained them in my garage and stuff like that. So, um, I was just looking for an organization to kind of help out and I couldn't really find any good ones. And then, you know, one day I'm scrolling the interweb and I come across catch a lift and, uh, I like look on the website and I'm like, man, this is awesome. This is like exactly what I'm looking yeah. for. You know, something to help, help other veterans. And, you know, uh, I sent that email like to apply to be a coach and help out. And I'm pretty sure it was you who emailed me back and we had like our first meeting in 2019 and I was just like, man, this is like amazing. This is like what I want to do. This is awesome. You know, and somehow, some way I decided it was a good idea to kind of let me be a part of the team. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. You know? <laughs> and uh, then you guys brought me to that uh, warrior weekend in 2019. That was like, honestly, the best time of our life. You know, my wife and I and the kids, you know, we were there. It was like, the most fun we ever had, you know, we got to stay in a nice hotel and hang out with all you guys and do a lot of fun things. And we just loved every minute of it, you know? So yeah, that was, we just kinda, that was, that was a terrific weekend. Let me ask you about that. Will. what was, um, because that all happened very fast for you. You know, we met you, um, you know, we hit it off with you right away. Uh, you can see your passion and drive and that literally all you wanted to do was give back to your brothers and sisters. Uh, and, and interestingly, all these years later talking to you, you have even more passion if it's possible than you did at that time. And you had so much passion then, but so this was really though your first live experience with catch a lift, uh, with meeting the catch a lift team, with meeting some of the veteran athletes that we brought. Uh, what did you take away from that meeting the team, meeting the athletes? Well, I saw that you guys actually helped veterans and you actually took care of the people and, you know, it wasn't just empty promises and commercials and stuff like that that you see on TV. It was it was actual results. You could see the people. You could talk to the people that it helped. And you could see all the other community people, like the peep sponsors and gyms. And so you could see all the people that actually cared. And that was big for me because I didn't want to waste my time helping people that don't actually help, you know, and giving my name to an organization that didn't actually help people. So when I saw that you guys truly did care and truly did take care of people and you're good human beings, I was like, this is it. This is who I want to be a part of, you know? And I was lucky enough that you guys took me on. So I definitely was grateful for that. And I still am to this day. Oh no, we've been, we've been blessed to have you a part of our team, Will. Uh, we're going to talk more about that in just a little bit, but because your life has taken uh, many different incredible twists and turns. So let's kind of, I don't even know if we're going backwards or forwards, but let's jump to 2022, which was a year in and of itself for everybody, right? The pandemic, the mm -hmm. shutdowns, and Will Irving, during 2020, you decided to go to the police academy. Talk to us about, yeah. number one, like, why, what led you to the police academy at that time, and then let's just talk about what that whole experience was like doing that during the year that 2020 was. Uh, so... When I was doing the transition courses to get out of the military, you know, I'm sitting there taking my notes because I want to do the best that I can. And, you know, I sat in the front, I listened to everybody talk, and then they had people come in and do their little, you know, sales pitch to get us to come be a part of their team, I guess, you know. And uh, I was just planning on going to college for athletic training, helping Cal, doing personal training. But I really have like a job plan, you know. So 
I didn't apply to gyms and I had started doing like my own personal training business and stuff like that. And I was like, well, I want benefits. I need benefits. So there was a police department there who decided not to hire me. Um, they asked me to come and do all their stuff. And I went and I did their fitness test and their reading test. And uh, I got the best scores out of everybody that was there for the PT test, the fastest times and all that stuff. And they told me, no, thank you. I was like, ah, you know? So I was like, yes, yeah. hello. Because I, I put all my eggs in that basket to go right. to that one place oh, in that one area. And so then I called the city that I work for now. And uh, I was like, look, I'm desperate. I need to know, like, what are the odds that I get picked? You know? And you know, like, well, you got to pass the test and do all this other stuff. And I was like, easy day, fitness test, got it. But yeah, like, right. I need, I, need, I need to know, like, if I pass the fitness test, I haven't committed a crime in a decade since I've been in the military. Like, what are my yeah. odds? You know? He said, Well, I think it'd be pretty good. I'm like, Don't tell me that because you're a recruiter and the recruiter's not. I need to know. Yeah. And uh, then I went, did the test and everything, and had a really good time. He kind of like hurried it up for me because of my timeline. So he let me okay. schedule things quicker because um, I only had two months. And uh, then they decided to hire me. And I was able to use my terminal leave, my 60 plus days of leave, get out early and work for them, you know, just nice. clean, yeah. doing odd jobs, whatever they needed me to do, which was awesome because I got to save some money and get myself in the area that I was going to be ultimately working in. Yeah. And then the academy started in January and it was like awesome. It was amazing. You know, it was boot camp all over again. You know, I would smile yeah. and get in trouble because <laughs> why are you smiling? Like, oh, I just, just laughing at myself for the stupidity of me signing myself up to get picked on all the time. You know, like every, every couple of uh, years I just sign myself up to get, be the lowest guy on the totem pole. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was a good academy. The instructors were awesome. The, the training was awesome. Um, you know, then all the craziness started happening. Yeah. People don't like yep. police officers. And I'm like, right. I mean, people have never liked me. So, you know, what's new? And uh, I'm just here to help people. So when people yeah. need me, I just go help. And that's about it. So, um, then we had a co-vacation during our academy. And it gave us about a 30-day break because somebody got sick. One person. And then it turned to two. And then three. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, my God. You know, here we go. Now I'm like what happens if we get fired? You know, like what happens now? You know? Cause I, like, I remember I talked to you during the summer of 2020 and it was when you all were on your COVID vacation, if we'll call it that, right? Like they shut y'all down. Um, and at that time, like when I talked to you, you didn't know, you didn't know if the Academy was, your class was going to start back up, what was going to happen at all. How were you staying mentally focused during that time to stay the course and kind of, I guess, what better word than just kind of endured all that was going on? Yeah, so uh, kind of a phrase that my wife and I live by, you know, and everybody else lives by it, but yeah, it is what it is, right? There's nothing I can't control what yeah. happens, and I was looking at other jobs and working for Cal and doing anything I could, you know, in case we got fired or they postponed it or something, you know, and we just kind of sat and waited, you know, I worked out every day, studied the material, you know, started looking around to see what else was out there just in case because you can't wait around you know something bad happens you gotta have another plan you gotta have a backup plan especially during the pandemic it's like for sure finding a job then was hard because nobody was doing remote yet but nobody was going into work everybody was just kind of like stagnant and you yep. we still need the money so you know i was just getting myself ready just in case something happened and then thankfully you know we went back we finished our last two months whatever we had to make up some time it ended up being a nine month academy because of our one month off so you know it was it was just waiting patiently waiting yeah so after all that time waiting and all the uncertainty what did it mean to you to graduate from the academy it was awesome uh you know to finally be done with all that learning and and actually be out there and helping people yeah. It was a great feeling, you know. I didn't know if it was ever going to come to an end. It didn't seem like it was. It just was like the longest, you know, time. And um, I thankfully went to a good part of the city that I enjoy. Um, and all the people on my squad were amazing. And it was That's great. 
it was phenomenal for me to go somewhere like that, you know. It's like being the new guy in the military. It's the same kind of feeling, you know. You're, are they going to dog on me? Like, I'm 30 years old. Like, I'm not yeah. that guy. Like, I cannot be dogged on. But I understand, you know, I'm the new guy. So I would pick on myself, you know. But they wouldn't pick on me. And I was like, this is weird. Like, I thought you guys were being <laughs> to me. You know, like, it's whatever. Like, I don't care. But, you know, I'm, I, it's okay. You can pick on me a little bit. Just understand yeah. I'm, a little, I'm a little bit older than the average new guy. And, uh, <laughs> you know. It was still a rough time because people still didn't like us, and uh, it is what it is. But every time somebody called, we went there and we helped them out. We got them to answer to their problems. You know, a lot of things with police officers is you, know, you only call them when you need something bad. You know, no one calls a police yep. officer for a good reason. No one right. calls them because they need something good. You can't do a fire wreck, it's not good for you. You know, something happens at home, it's not good for you. You're sick or something, it's not good. You know, so there's really never a good instance where people typically have interactions with police officers and just how it is. So we got to make the most of it. You know, that's on us to, to keep, keep professional and, you know, be the best person that we can be for those people in a time yeah. of need, you know. So it's just kind of, you know, what I've been trying to focus on myself is, you know, I understand that you're going through whatever it is, you know, so it shows some compassion and understanding, you know. I think you've you've explained it to me like that before. You've said that oftentimes, you know, when you do go to a person, when you meet someone, you're, you know, you're meeting them very likely on maybe the worst day of their life or one of the worst. Um, you know, Will, you have a you have a great passion, obviously, for helping others, but you have a great passion specifically for helping those with mental illnesses. Will you talk to us a little bit about that and how your work on the police force has really aided in that? So I don't even know kind of how it how it happened or why you know, it just seems that somehow I kind of gravitate towards the mental health part of the job. Um, a lot of the calls that I typically respond to have to deal with mental health, whether somebody's in crisis or somebody's relatives in crisis or something like that. And, you know, when I was on field training, it didn't happen a lot. And so I didn't really have a whole lot of experience with it. And then my last two weeks of field training started getting a little bit more. And then, once I was on my own and out in the wild all by myself, it was like, man, all of a sudden it was just mental health. And I think a lot of it had to do with people being stuck at home and not interacting with others and stuff like that. But right. it seemed to be there was about one or two every shift, you know, which is a lot. Oh, and then man. sometimes oh, yeah. it would it would get to three and Sometimes I would just be talking to someone and then all of a sudden it would turn into a mental health crisis. And I'm like, I, I didn't even say anything. You're just talking at me, yeah. you know, like I didn't do anything, did I? And it's like nothing I did, but it's just pent up stuff coming out. And the biggest thing is you just got to be patient. You know, uh, I work for 12 hours no matter what. So it doesn't matter if it takes me 12 hours to deal with that one person. I'll sit there right. for 12 hours. So I'm still getting paid the same. And if I got to stay late, I get a little bit more vacation time on the back end. It doesn't bother me. Yeah. You know, so the military kind of helped me out there because working extra hours doesn't really bother, bother me. Right. I have a lot of patience. So typically, you know, someone will be talking for about an hour or so before we make any moves, you know, to, to go on to wherever they need to go, get whatever help that they need. Um, and the mental health aspect is a very slow process. And there's nothing that we can really do. I can just take you where you need to go and follow up with you if you need me to and take you every time you need to go. But other than that, you got to go to these hospitals and doctors and facilities and they got to do whatever they got to do to help you out. So, but they're not out there when the crisis is happening. So, you know, we try our best to de-escalate and talk to people. Right. You know, I'm just a big, I'm a big old punching bag for people whenever they get sad, you know. Yeah. It is what it is. I'm still young and dumb enough to kind of take that abuse. <laughs> and I'm glad oh, will. But, I let people beat up on me all the time. If it means that I get to take them someplace to get the help they need, you know, that's whatever. But, you know, everybody calls me dumb for it. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you, Will, for, uh, for your service to our great country. And thank you for the service that you continue to give to our great nation. It's tremendous. Um, so you've, you know, you've handled a lot of different types of mental health crises on the force as a cop. Could you speak to us a little bit, Will, you know, from that position and from what you've seen, what resources are available for a person in crisis that isn't typically thought about? 
Yeah, so I've had a couple veterans. So the stuff that I do with Cal kind of led me to succeed a little bit on this uh, more than just being a regular police officer. But uh, so I've had a couple veterans in crisis and stuff like that. They call and they, they have uh, issues and stuff. And they, everybody always complains about you know, certain organizations. They go talk to them and call them, but they're not doing anything. And, you know. I hate not giving somebody an answer, so I got other resources. And you know, in our area, there's a bunch of hospitals. You know, where if you have a mental crisis, we can take you to this hospital. And it's not you know like a VA hospital or anything like that. It's just a regular hospital, and they'll help you find either an outpatient or inpatient care. You know, um, so that's just kind of how it all started. I, I started gathering some of these resources and. There's an organization called NAMI, it's the National Alliance for Mental Illness, and they teach police officers their crisis intervention training. And I just kind of started going on their website and emailing the veterans outreach people and stuff like that just to kind of see what they did. Um, they have some great resources for any veteran in any city, state, zip code. You, know, you go, they have one in pretty much each county. Uh, you know, you go on their website, you can pretty much find some place to get you help if you're in crisis. And, you know, for veterans or anybody else that's kind of struggling, you can always call 911 and paramedics or police officers will come and they'll talk to you and they'll get you to where you need to go. You don't have to schedule a doctor's appointment. You don't have to wait six to eight weeks for a psychiatrist to see you. Call, get someone to come help you, get them to take you somewhere right now and i i tell people i'll walk you in the back door and that's kind of how i sell it you know when i see someone who's in true crisis because you know we have one person who they were just tired of waiting you know their medicine ran out they couldn't see right. the doctor for six months and i'm like look dude i will just walk you through the back door and i'll take you in there and tell them that you need it and we'll get you the help that you need and he just walked right into the back of the car you know made sure his pockets were empty <laughs> that was yeah. it you right. in. Then I walk him into the hospital and I'm like, he can't leave. You know, he's a danger, but he thinks he can't. So don't like, you know, yeah. escalate him. Cause right now he's calm. You know, he's, he's understanding, he's patient. And I've kind of explained to him like, look, dude, this is an emergency situation, but we're not going to call it that because that's what yeah. you don't want it to be called. So I'll do whatever you want to, you know? So, um, it just takes a lot of patience and understanding. You know? Sometimes it gets frustrating because they get violent and angry towards you, but they can't control it. And yeah. just like a lot of the, the veterans that I've helped with Cal through the years, you know, they have times where they're in a dark place. That it kills me because I'm so far away from a lot of them, you know, but I've made it kind of like my goal to find other resources for them so we can get them the help that they need wherever they're at, you know, because Cal vets are all over country and they need to help them. So, Will, I want to I want to jump us back up because you you come back to Cal, Cal full full steam in a in a very interesting way, right? From the police department. So let's speed up to August twenty twenty one. Would you touch on the the injury you suffered, Will? <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, you know it was night shift, and it was the worst night shift twenty eight day rotation ever. You know, I've only had six months of experience, not not a whole lot, but. Um, it was a rough go. There was a lot of chaos and violence and stuff. And it was a three week stretch that I was getting into uses of force or having to you know, put hands on people because of what they were doing to me. And I kept getting hurt and stuff like that. And it was like bound to happen, you know? So three weeks prior, somebody hurt their girlfriend. They fought with us. They ran away. Then somebody tried to come at us with two knives in each hand. Then some guy ran away behind the house, and we wrestled in poison ivy. And then Thursday, August, if, uh, you know, we're sitting there minding our own business. It's now August 6th at, like, 3 in the morning. We're about to get off in, like, four hours. I'm super excited for the weekend. It's about to be day shift, you know. It's awesome. Sun is shining. And... Somebody was not having a good night, and they had a sword, like a medieval a sword. sword. Oh and, my gosh! Uh, some knives, and decided they didn't like anybody in the apartment complex. You know, so 
not my area of the city, so I just kind of waited to see if they needed extra hands because there's more than capable officers. And uh, I started kind of going that way a little bit slow, just in case. Yeah. Um, and then the officer who was there, he said he needed help. And he was a Marine, and I never heard him ask for help. So I was like, oh, well, here we go. Yeah. And uh, turn on the fast light and the fast sound and get there before anybody else and i was like okay nobody else is here guy kind of got the guy sitting down on the ground talking to him friendly head and eyes i didn't see him so i didn't know where they were you know he went to go put handcuffs on him and the guy tried to fight him and so i stepped in and put my hands on him told him to stop like look dude we're not trying to fight you you know we don't want to do this and he decided he really wanted to and uh he stood up on us and we're wrestling with them and we, I don't know what's in any of the hands or any of the pockets or any of the waist right. So I told the other officer like, Hey, I'm just going to put him on the ground and we'll, we'll deal with it then. You know, and when I went to go put him on the ground, both him and the officer landed on my leg and snapped my ankle in half. And I was like, man, that really, I really just sprained my ankle. <laughs> you know? And, uh, now I'm on the ground holding on to this guy and holding his arms behind his back. And I'm like, hey, dude, get the cuffs on him. Get him off me because my ankle hurts. <laughs> and, uh, you know, struggle for a second. I'm like, no, dude, like, get him, get off now. Get off right now. I can't I can't take it anymore. And so yeah. I push him off, walk around. I'm like, man, I've never sprained my ankle like that, you know? And I'm just walking around like an idiot. <laughs> and uh, got on the ambulance. And they're like, take your boot off. I'm like, no, I'm not taking my boot off because my foot's going to swell up. Like, let me get done with the shift and I'll wrap it. And I'll just ice and all the, change my socks and drink some water, you know, military stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Protocol. Then they were like, no, you need to go to the doctor. You need to get looked at, you know, whatever. I was like, okay, fine. So drove my car back to the station, uh, went into the report writing room, typed up what happened, took a shower, put my Crocs on. Walked myself back to my car, drove to the hospital, walked into the ER, hung out, did some x rays. The doctor came in after the x rays and he said, Do you want some pain medicine? I'm like, No, I'm fine. You know, I just sprained my ankle. I just need like an ace bandage, or maybe like an ice pack or something like that. <laughs> and he's like, he's like oh. No, your ankle is like super broken. And I was like, What do you mean super broken? They're like broken? Like, what is the difference between broken and super broken? Right, yeah. And he said, It's like, it's broken. And I was like, Okay. So he showed me the x-rays, and I was just like, I could just tell, like, oh, God, here we go. Because I was planning on going back to work on Monday, you know? Like, right, whatever. Yeah. A sprained ankle, who cares? And uh, nope, they pooped on my parade and uh, put a spoon on me, and they're like, stop walking. Stop. And I was like, okay, I guess. And then uh, saw orthopedic doctor and he was like, yeah, got to do surgery. And I never had surgery like that before. And I'm like, I do, here we go. I got a plate put in the right side of my ankle, my right leg. And then I still had ligament damage. So I had to do a second surgery at the end of August. And then the end of September was when I was finally able to kind of like be in a boot and crutches. And then last month was physical therapy. Physical therapy slow. I'm not patient. I'm a stubborn guy. So... I've been doing kettlebell swings and squats and all kinds of things because I'm like, I got a little weak leg now. I got to like build it back up, you know? Yeah. So, um, I have my doctor's appointment tomorrow where they tell me like, you know, whether or not I'll be good. And uh, I told my physical therapist like, yeah, look, man, I've been deadlifting like 315 and I started jogging on the treadmill. I'm sure and they like that. Yeah, he was like, yeah. what? What do you mean? And I'm like, dude, I just can't wait. Like, I just can't wait because... At one point, the doctor is just going to be like, you can go back to work, boom. And like, I got to yeah. be ready. I can't just like. It's true. Right. Oh, now I'm going to start working out. You know, like I got to be ready to go because no one's going to help you in a fight. You know, yeah. you got to be ready for whoever comes your way. And you know, I got to train because if I don't train, whoever's coming to hurt me is training, you know. So just a vicious oh, cycle, man. I guess. But um, I feel good. I feel all right. I've been driving and doing everything they tell me I'm not supposed to do for the last two months. So. You know, it is what it is. It is what it is. It's uh, it's great you're you know going in that that positive direction and 
you know, I'm sure they haven't been happy about what you've been doing, but I think it's awesome how proactive you have been. And because like you said, you know, your reality and it's very possible even like tomorrow, maybe that doctor says it's time to go back, you know, to the force. You got to be ready. You got to be ready for whatever fights at hand. So, you know, much respect for that. Um, as horrendous, I'm certain as that injury was for you and your family, you know, to deal with and everything, it had a, it had a very bright spot for us at Kale. Um, you know, I got another text or call from you that you were on recliner duty for the next three months. And, you know, if I could use any help right now and funny thing was I could use a lot of help. So, you know, we were so very grateful, Will, that yet again, you stepped in for us. Um, you've coached uh, quite a number of vets the last few months again. Um, and we were very, very honored. I'm very excited to, to tell everyone about that. We were, we were honored to hire you as the assistant head coach for Catch a Lift. Um, so we're very excited about that and everything that the coaching team has in store for our veteran athletes in 2022. I want to ask you a little bit though, Will, um, because the wellness groups are something that are fairly new to Catch a Lift. We started them in 2021. We put through three groups of veterans this year and you came in for that third group to do coaching or end a second group and third group. Um, what was that experience like for you working in those wellness groups? Cause that was, that was kind of a new model that we'd had since you'd done, done some coaching with us. So that for me was kind of right in my wheelhouse and kind of what I've been doing anyway. I liked it because it, it makes the veterans who come to Cal have a little bit of a buy-in, right? Yeah. Instead of just getting rewarded right off the bat, you know, they do deserve things, but there's so many others that also deserve things. So we need to make sure that you're going to stick with us and help the program. And so I really enjoy the wellness program. So you can see who truly wanted to help and who truly cared about getting better and helping themselves. And, you know, they have little to no equipment. So I got to come up with random ideas for them to do body weight things or band workouts. Cause you guys give them awesome bands and stuff. And, and it just, helps open up their eyes to seeing that they don't need all the fancy stuff yeah. they can do these little things each day and just stop eating junk and yeah. you know they'll get better and it'll help them out and a lot of their mental health goes away their issues go away when they start eating better you know and drinking water again and doing all that other stuff that they did in the military and right. it kind of fell down because people stopped checking up on them and they stopped checking up on themselves and uh the wellness groups were amazing. I've had so many great veterans, you know, that I've talked to every single day. And they That's every awesome. pound, every milestone, every my daughter did this, or my kids did that. It's like the most amazing thing. You know, I got a YouTube video, a fifteen minute YouTube video and a text message yesterday from one of the cow vets who bought a, a farm and it's like the coolest thing ever because it's like I know this guy. He's in yeah. Arizona. You know, and he talks to me every day and it's like the coolest thing to see him like go from where he was to where he's at right now, see him succeed and crush it. You know, it's like, that's why I do this because they're just like, they're like siblings, you know, or something. I don't know. Yeah. They're not kids, but they're, they're yeah. something. And you see him with all these, these cool things that they're doing. You're like, dang, this is awesome. You know, and, it is. Uh, then they graduate on to getting gear and stuff and i'm like all right now it's time to actually move some weight you know like you ready for it and sometimes there are sometimes they're not you know it doesn't matter we work through it together you know and seeing them learn new things and lifts and stuff and that's like my biggest thing is <clears throat> i don't tell people what to do for exercises i ask them what they want to do and then i help them program it and it because anybody can do what they're told you know, I can tell them Absolutely. what to do yep. all day, every day, but that doesn't mean it's what they want to do. I hate cardio. Cardio is the stupidest thing ever. I need to do it, and I do it because <laughs> I'm happy for my job. Oh, I love but, it. I love it. But I hate it. So if you don't I get do it. it, I'm not, I'm not going to program it for you. We're going to find other ways to get you the cardio workout without running seven miles. You know, we can do little 30 seconds here and there in between sets and stuff like that and get you the results that you want without making you do 25, 30 minutes of cardio. And, yeah. Uh, so that's why I need their input and I need them to tell me what they like and what they don't like so we can come up with their plan, not my plan. And they love that kind of stuff. And it's awesome because it, it it's, it's a little bit more success rate for me, you know, with these vets because it's something that they enjoy doing. And then we do little fun challenges 
and it just makes them do other little fun things. So, to, so that was one of that was one of the other kind of new things, Will, that you came into, like when you came back coaching a lot with Catch Lift here this fall, was that we had Vet Connect going, right? And it's in its first few months, you know, and so we're still getting, you know, veterans using it, coaches using it. Man, you have had tremendous success with it, with your veterans the last couple months. Talk to us about that. You run challenges on there. It's, it's absolutely amazing to see these veterans supporting one another, like, and to watch that community grow. Talk to us a bit about that. So, you know, a lot of us veterans, a lot of veterans, they don't really like dealing with people and going out to the public and doing things. And um, Vet Connect is the perfect place because it's it's a social media just for veterans just for cal veterans so nobody else can post their drama or their baloney or whatever it's yeah. just us and our fitness journeys and sharing a little bit about our life journeys and tips and tricks and helping each other out so i love that connect because it really gives them a spot where they can kind of go on the internet without going to the other places on the internet right. that stress them out or they don't like or whatever and uh in my group um, I beg and message and bother all my vets to share things all the time. And every now and then I get a couple of bites, you know, but it is, it's awesome. So I've been sharing my rehab journey for my physical therapy, you know, yep. doing lunges in my boot and stairs in my boot and goblet squats in the boot and stuff <laughs> like that. And asking people to share a little bit about them. And, um, we did like a squat challenge. Everybody squatted their age, you know, and. We had one went up and down the stairs with his family, and that was an awesome video to watch, you know, seeing people get active with their kids and stuff. Yeah. Thanksgiving was fun. We did a kettlebell swing challenge, you know, for those of us who actually made turkeys. So uh, we <laughs> oh, did kettlebell swings attacked. with our turkeys. <laughs> I mean, you got the turkeys, you know, you got the turkeys <laughs> at the house. So um, we, we uh, did 21 kettlebell swings for 2021 uh, with our turkeys. And I had, a, I had a couple people post, and it was awesome. Um, and, you know, weight loss journeys. You know, one of the Calvets he sent me, who wasn't specifically on this group, you know, because of circumstance, she's lost almost 80 pounds, you know. She's yeah, training she's for a half, yep. half marathon. And it's like, that's like the most incredible thing for me to see, you know. And I love it when people like that share, you know, because you see – actual results of the actual work you do and yeah it, it, it just makes makes you feel awesome about it you know and those are the kinds of people that we do this for absolutely thank you for sharing that with us will uh for any of our catch lift veteran members listening will how can they find you on vet connect your group if they do want to interact yeah my group is give more mind and body um and you'll find me on that connect i'm usually always online because my laptop's always on so you can always see my stupid face uh, with the uh, people that are online so you just click my stupid face and then you connect to me and then uh, when you go to my groups on the left side of my page you can find my group that i'm in there and join the group and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing and where you're at in your journeys and stuff like that because we love to have people share absolutely um, yeah, I would, I would highly invite any, um, invite and encourage any Cal vets listening to jump on Will's group. It's a lot of fun. And really any of the groups on uh, Vet Connect, get in there, interact with the coaches, uh, interact with each other. It's a tremendous community. And like Will said, the, the real beauty in Vet Connect is that it's a completely private social media that's accessible only to our veteran athletes. You can't Google your way in. You cannot get in there unless you're an approved member of our program. There's nothing political. There's nothing social. Like said you know it's it's about our journey our recoveries it's it's positivity uh it's camaraderie it's it's really really good stuff um i have one last question that i want to ask you today will what does it mean to you to be cal strong well for me all these veterans have already overcome so many tremendous obstacles and odds right and for some reason they can't see all the amazing things that they've done and catch a lift kind of helps them remember who they are as a as a member of society as a warrior as a citizen to the country and i love you know seeing how catch a lift helps people remember who they are who they were because right. there's still these amazing people that have done all these amazing things yeah. but they just kind of seem to forget that that's who they are 
and watch the resources and everything that catch a lift provides and rekindle the fire if you will in these veterans it's it's really amazing to watch and uh, i appreciate every minute that i'm able to be a part of the the transition for these guys as they go from you know forgetting to remembering yeah. and watching the success and the, the little uh obstacle that they overcome you know even just with us for a couple weeks 12 weeks for will and his vets you know yeah. it's amazing you know because then you, you see the light bulbs click when they oh i remember i used to love eating this oh i remember i used yeah. to love doing this workout and you know watching people remember how strong they were and how strong they are it's just it's a great feeling it is it's tremendous Thank you, Will. Thank you so much again for your service to our great country. Thank you for the service that you continue to provide to our veteran community, to our nation, to your local community. It's tremendous. That's it for this week's episode of Coach's Corner. We will return next Wednesday at 1 Eastern time with another new episode. Thank you, Will, for sharing your story and your light with us all. Thank you to ID Technologies for your support of this podcast. Thank you to Lynn Coughlin, Henry Pomper, and Kaylee Nasiri for your work to make this podcast possible. And thank you to the entire Catch a Lift team. Don't forget to join us every Wednesday live at 1 p.m. Eastern on YouTube for a chance to win Cal Swag and to chat with your brothers and sisters. Until next week, keep it real and stay Cal strong. <laughs>